likely wisdom. And we're going to be talking about God's perfect timing. Not our timing, but God's timing. And so, um, if you can open up, let's open up together. If you have your Bibles, um, we have Bibles in the back too, and we'll have it up in the uh, projector screen for both those here in person and those online to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 al 11. And um, in whatever season of life that you're in, whether you're younger, whether you're older, whether you're in a season of starting something new or closing a season, I believe that this word is for you and for each one of us. So let's go ahead and open up and, and hear now with, uh, with open hearts and open ears to the word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to uproot. There's a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. There's a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We thank God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your word is precious and that your word is on time, Lord God. And that your word, Lord, is is perfect time and god we just pray that you would meet us here in this place and here in this space this morning god speak to us in a way that's fresh in a way that's new lord use us god for your purposes to be a good news community to be people that reflect you jesus in our lives our words and our actions Lord, we continue to pray for our world and we take intentional time, Lord, before we hear your words to always pray for this world that desperately needs you, God. We pray for those continued uh, to be impacted and in years now of rebuilding, Lord, after Hurricane Ian in the, in the southern uh, east of the United States, Lord, in Florida and South Carolina, Lord. We also pray, Lord, locally here, um, when we hear just very uh, challenging and disturbing updates, Lord God, especially with that family from the Sikh community, Lord, over in Merced this last week, Lord, our hearts, our prayers are with them, Lord God, and we grieve with them as well, Lord. We grieve with that community even in this time as your people, Lord. Continue to use us, Lord as people that taste like the fruits of your spirit, to even show up and love and care for people who don't look, think, act like us, Lord, and may even have a, a different um, uh, culture, Lord, or tradition than us, Lord. God, we pray for all of those that continue to be impacted by the, the economy, by continued inflation, by economic challenges, Lord God. It seems like we're all asking, Lord, how long until what time, and as of right now, there still is no end in sight, God. But we're going to trust you. We're going to hope in you. We're going to believe in you, Lord. 
We pray, God, for this world, and again, just as this passage says, Lord, there is so much capacity for good, for love, but there's also so much capacity for challenge and hurt, God. We pray for Europe and the continued uh, uh, war there, Lord God, and um, just these, these alarms going up, Lord, about using well, weapons, testing nuclear weapons, all of that, Lord, in Asia as well, God. And Lord, we pray for, for your people everywhere. We, think, we pray for the global south, those in Latin America and the African continent, Lord, where the majority of your followers are today, Lord, in 2022. And help us, Lord, to just um, learn from and stand along with our sisters and brothers around the world, Lord. We love you and we pray all of this, God. We pray for the sick. We continue to lift up our dear brother, Ruben Madrid, Lord God. We have prayed for your healing, for a miracle, Lord God. And we also pray prayers of surrender and trust, Lord, knowing that you hold him. You hold all those, Lord, that are navigating sickness right now. And we pray for those in our congregation who are as well, Lord, recovering from COVID, recovering from um, uh, different um, situations and different diagnoses, Lord, pneumonia as well, Lord. We've had that within our community. And God, I just pray your hand of comfort, your hand of healing. And Lord, give us that true comfort that only you can give us. Fix our eyes on you, on you today, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Well, we're continuing in this uh, series where we're asking God to give us wisdom wisdom from above, an unlikely wisdom that doesn't come from any of us. None of us could think this stuff up, really. And that's been our, our prayer over the last several weeks, that God would give us wisdom. We don't just need more knowledge. We don't just need more information. We need God's wisdom. Not just more groupthink, not just more polarization. We need wisdom an unlikely wisdom. And really, it's been a journey of faith-seeking understanding as we've been studying the book of Ecclesiastes together. And Ecclesiastes in the Bible is one of the books of wisdom. And um, in, uh, we, we've shared this before, but just as a brief little review, Ecclesiastes means gathered wisdom. Um, uh, and it really talks about, in this special book, Ecclesiastes talks to us about where we are meant to find true meaning and true purpose in this life. And that's something that all of us can relate to, whether we're younger, whether we're older, whether we're seasoned, whether we are uh, rich, whether we're poor, whether we're in any context. This applies to us. We're all searching for meaning. We're all searching for purpose in this life. We're all searching for a place to belong. And throughout this special book of wisdom, we see all kinds of human attempts from the author, from Solomon, who's been there, who's done that. He tried to find all kinds of ways to find satisfaction through things that at the end of the day simply did not satisfy. They worked for a bit until they didn't. We see here Solomon, again, speaking for the human condition in many ways, trying to find uh, meaning through uh, and happiness through all kinds of things that, um, would, would, that we try as well, through achievements, through success, through money, through pleasures. But then at the end of the day, all of that, as we've learned over the past couple of weeks, is simply meaningless. It's a vapor. It comes and it goes. Last week, we talked about taking that journey from comparison to contentment. That comparison really is just chasing after the wind. It takes all of our energy, all of our time, and the result is nothing except exhaustion, bitterness, anger. But contentment is finding God here and now. That's where unlikely wisdom takes us reminding us that only God will truly satisfy. No one and nothing else will do. True satisfaction 
only comes from knowing God and from being grateful to enjoy what God has given us here and now. The truth is all of us are just one step away. We're one step away from joy and wisdom. We're one step away from self-sabotage and self-destruction. Which path will we take? Each choice that we make can be a clear path toward life and wisdom or another direction. Only God will be able to fulfill the true longing that we have, the deep longing to find purpose and identity, that true hunger that each one of us has in our life journey. Solomon, he did everything to seek wisdom. He was extremely wealthy, but still that wasn't enough. So if you ever think to yourself, only if I had more, only if I had this amount, you know, there's even been uh, research on this that there really is no difference in quality of life and happiness from someone who makes $75,000 to someone who makes $750,000. It's, it's quite unique, you know, um, uh, that those things will not satisfy. They can just add more to our lives, but they really can't take too much away. So he, Solomon was extremely wealthy, but that still wasn't enough. That wasn't satisfying Solomon viewed all of that success as, again, just vapor, meaningless, trying to grasp something. Like when the example we've been giving before is uh, the word for, for meaningless in Ecclesiastes is vapor. So if I had a spray bottle here and we sprayed it and we all tried to just grab that vapor together, that's meaningless. Solomon, he wanted to know deeper ways to know God, to know the wisdom of God and he wanted to share that wisdom with others. He made a lot of mistakes in his life, and the Bible doesn't try to cover that up or sugarcoat that. And in fact, we're even going to talk a little bit about that today. But one thing that Solomon, in his old age, as he wrote Ecclesiastes, he reveals to us a couple of things that, that he's learned. He answers Danny's question, Danny's hope through relationships question today. If I could share with you or myself something now as an old man that I wish I would have known when I was a young person, this is what I would say. And this is part of what Solomon teaches in Ecclesiastes. He teaches that God's wisdom is available to those who seek it. God's wisdom is available to those who seek it. And the fear of the Lord is the first step toward wisdom. Again, that can sound like a big, intimidating word, but the fear of the Lord is just a change in attitude. When we change our attitude before God toward ourselves, toward others, that is the first step toward wisdom. When we change our attitude from wanting to just, you know, have my will be done and my way or the highway to then changing that to openness, to humility, to surrender, that will lead toward wisdom. So today we're going to reflect um, just a little bit on the passage that we read here today, which talked about the, a time for everything. There is a time and a season for everything under the sun, for everything in this life, as the passage says. There's a time for this and a time for that. It will come and, if, and it will go. Here's the truth. If we're honest, regardless of what time in life we're in, whether we're younger, older, in between, whatever season, if we're honest, then we will admit that all of us have asked God the big question of timing before. We've asked the question when we've been in seasons of waiting, in seasons of discerning. We've cried out that same question that the psalmist David cries out to God when he says, how long, O Lord? How long? How long must I wait? How long until you come through here? Right now, maybe some of you are going through a similar season where you're asking, how long, oh God? What is that big question for you that you're bringing before God in this time? If you're anything like me, 
Maybe you've spent time, energy. Maybe you've shed many tears asking that question through the challenges that you've been going through. You've asked God, how long? When, O Lord? How long must I wait for you? When will this season end? When will a new season begin? And God, can you give me maybe just an exact time and date for that? So that, you know, we can make an appointment, right? When, God, how long? When will I experience breakthrough in my life? When will I experience breakthrough in my family relationships that have been broken? When will I experience breakthrough in my work, in my ministry, in my call, in my friendships, in my schoolwork? When will I graduate? When will I start my career path, really? When will things get back to normal? When will I be normal one day? When will I be ready to take that next step in my life? and in my career? When can I take that next step in adulthood, in manhood, in womanhood, in seeking the Lord as a disciple? How long, O Lord? How long? Jesus really has a way of turning all of our reality right side up in incredible ways. And I want you to know, friend, brother, sister, younger, older, know this. The Lord hears your prayers. The Lord knows your heart. He knows and He hears all of our cries. In fact, that's what the Scriptures remind us of. He is with the brokenhearted. He engages and He responds to all of our cries out to Him. And we've said this before, but God always responds to prayer. And that answer to our prayers some uh, uh, will oftentimes be yes. Sometimes the answer will be wait, which may be a season that we're, many of us have experienced. But also God sometimes responds no. No is a response. <laughs> no, it's not a response we like. But he doesn't just leave us hanging there. He says no because I have something much greater for you. Something greater than you can even think of or imagine. So hold on. Wait. Do not give up. Do not give in. The Lord hears our prayers. And it's incredible because when it comes to time, really Jesus and the work of the gospel has a way of being able to transform all of our ideas around time and, the, and, and how it works, right? Right? We sometimes think of, of time and we allow our whole lives to be controlled by it, right? By appointments, by, uh, by, by settings, by uh, commitments, and all of that, right? But the gospel transforms our idea of time and how it works. On the cross, Jesus actually transforms time and reality. He transforms the present and he redeems the past and he gives us hope for the future. So even all of time has been transformed and redeemed by God on the cross. Jesus restores our past. He guides us in the present. And he secures our future. Time has been redeemed. There is no just wasted time. We are to make the most of every single opportunity. When we're in Christ, when we're in seasons of waiting, unlikely wisdom that we read here in Ecclesiastes actually reminds us that there is no such thing as wasted time. We can learn to be eternally minded. God is constantly shaping us in every single season that we find ourselves, even in seasons of waiting, even in seasons of longing, even in seasons of, 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 of feeling down, of feeling up, of everything in between. There is everyday purpose for the eternally minded. Nothing gets wasted for God. 
you know, and there is a time and a place for everything also. I love how it, it, it tells us in the book of Romans, right, in chapter uh, 12, we grieve with those who grieve, we rejoice with those who rejoice. There's a time and a place for everything under the sun. Truly a time for every season. It's been kind of fun in this series. We've been um, mentioning a lot of music and even the way that the book of Ecclesiastes has impacted uh, music and, uh, and American and, and uh, uh, um, classic, uh, cl- uh, classic rock music as well. Uh, a couple weeks ago when we started, right, we talked about how Ecclesiastes chapter 1 could have been the inspiration for that Rolling Stones song, No Satisfaction, right? And then there's this other song from the 1960s Some of you know it. I may even want to invite some of our sisters and brothers from that generation up here. (laughs) But it's this song, and and Papa John is smiling at me already because he probably knows which one it is. It's called Turn, Turn, Turn. To every season, turn. It's a song that was made popular in the 1950s and 60s by this group called The Birds. And... That song was a number one hit around the world. And it actually got its lyrics directly from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. They were literally reading the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes, and it became a number one hit. Again, I I want to invite even some some of our sisters and brothers from that generation to come and sing it for us, because they know what we're talking about. It's the one that says... To every season, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn. There is a time, there is a purpose for everything under the sun. You know, if we, if we weren't in that, in that season, maybe we don't remember, but if you're like an 80s or 90s kid like me, and you ever watched The Wonder Years, that song was always in the background, so <laughs> you may know what that is or not, that's fine. But in, in that lyric, it actually just reads the first eight verses of the book of Ecclesiastes. It literally says this in that pop song. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to reap, a time which is planted, a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There is a time, there is a season for everything. And friends, brothers, sisters, it's time for you and I to face this truth. Stop pretending. Stop trying to just manipulate outcomes because the truth is you and I are not in control of time. It doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to you or to me. You're not in control of time, neither am I. We're called to steward our time because we live within time. It is a gift that God has given us. But oftentimes we live our lives just responding to circumstances and trying to control time in one way or another. But you and I know all it takes is just one moment to remind us that we are not in control of time. One moment, one phone call, one situation, one diagnosis, one sickness, one relational breakdown, one communication breakdown to just face up to this bitter truth that we tirelessly tirelessly try to run away from. We are not in control of time. Many of us are in seasons of waiting, or we've been in seasons of waiting. And what does waiting actually do? Waiting reminds us of this truth. We are not in control of time. We are not in control of circumstances. This is the season that we each find ourselves in. What are you waiting for? How can you draw near to God as you're waiting? 
As the time approaches, remember there will be a time and a season for everything under the sun. The only catch is you and I aren't in control of that. God is, and His timing is perfect. Waiting actually is a, a big theme um, for, for, uh, for many stories. And in fact, one very famous writer who was probably like Solomon, extremely brilliant, extremely wise, but also very foolish in other ways through his actions. Some of you have read him before. You know the writer Ernest Hemingway. And he used to write about just the power of waiting and the power of time. You know, there's this story, Old Man in the Sea. Most of the, of the tension within that story is just an, about an old man waiting for something. Waiting and time passing, that, that's one of the primary tensions that uh, Hemingway would use in all of his fictional stories. Not much was happening, but all of the tension was within that, within the waiting for something to happen. Hemingway seemed to think what Ecclesiastes here is confirming, that waiting does not have the time or the power, sorry, waiting does not have the power to break us. But waiting does have the power to reveal us, to reveal who we truly are, to reveal what's really going on under the surface, right? It's almost like I, I'm that kind of personality, and I kind of get that from Ecclesiastes, just kind of after beating around the bush and then hearing someone finally sharing what they really feel. Then I think to myself, okay, now we're talking. Now we're really talking here. And that's what waiting will do. It has the power to reveal us to go to those deeper places with the Lord. Waiting will often reveal who we are deep inside, what we're feeling, the tensions, the challenges. This season of waiting has clearly revealed that for many of us, whatever it is that you may be waiting for. But then sometimes in that time of waiting, God is trying to reveal new things. Then what do we do? We just distract ourselves. We get ourselves busy. We run in the other direction. We suppress. We distract. And in this season of waiting, God will reveal new things to us. New things to us as a community, new things to you as a person in your journey with God. But one thing that waiting always reminds us of is the fact that we're deeply aware of, but we try to run away from it. Waiting reminds us that we are not in control of time. We're not in control of circumstances. The hard truth that Scripture has a way of reminding us of is this fact. We're more, we're, we are more vulnerable. We are more powerless than we actually want to admit. But then the flip side of that, of that coin is that God is so much more powerful than we want to admit. That God does promise that we won't be waiting forever. There will be a time and a place and a season for that to be fulfilled. Solomon, he's a man of authority. Many of you have authority. He's a man of wealth, greater wealth than any of us would ever known. He had status in society beyond what many of us would ever experience. He gave orders and things happened. But as he reflects on his life, Solomon recognizes that God in his power is ultimately the one in control of time and of circumstances. Solomon, no matter how much authority, how much wealth he had, he could not control timing. You know, Solomon got to fulfill something that his father David wasn't able to do. David wanted to build a temple for God, and God said, no, not now. It's not the time. But David was like, but my intention is really good. It's not time. Solomon got to build the temple for the Lord. 
his own son. Wow, how magnificent, how incredible is that? But then what happened? Solomon tried to control circumstances within the own mess within his family, and he started to worship idols in the temple of the Lord. Solomon had good intentions, but terrible impact. He built a temple for the Lord, then started to worship idols when things were not going his way. When God was not giving him the answers that he liked, he started turning toward other idols. Does any of that sound familiar? Solomon loses hope when things don't go his way. When God says, not right now, wait, stop, Solomon is like, well, let me go somewhere else then. That was actually the start of Solomon's downfall. When instead of yielding, instead of surrendering to the Lord, to his timing, Solomon tried to take matters into his own hands. Solomon's biggest problem is not that he's a slow learner. Solomon was like a lot of you here. He was extremely intelligent. He was extremely able But Solomon's biggest problem is not that he's a slow learner, but that he was a quick forgetter. He forgot quickly what God had taught him in the light. He forgot in those moments of darkness. He knew the power of God. He knew that time was in God's hands. But when things got desperate, he turned to himself. He turned to idols. He was a quick forgetter. You and I have been there. You and I have done that before. And that's why every single week, we don't forsake this. We don't forsake coming together as a community, as it says in the book of Hebrews, as some are in the habit of doing. Because we come together to remind each other, to remind each other of the living God, to remind each other of the love and the power of God. Again, not because we are slow learners, but because we are quick forgetters. We're all going to be inspired by God's word this morning, and then Monday's going to come, and we're going to have the same temptation as Solomon to turn toward idols, to try to control circumstances. Again, not because we're slow learners, but because we're quick forgetters. So, friends, brothers, sisters, what's your attitude? before God today? What's your posture before God today? In the season of waiting that you're in, are you waiting by faith or waiting by fear? Let's be honest. Now's the time to be honest. You know, in the waiting, this is where God says, now we're talking, now we're actually getting to the real heart of the matter. You can sugarcoat it with others, but not with me. Are you waiting in faith? Are you waiting in fear? Who we are before God is who we really are. Let's bring our real selves before a real God. When you ask yourself that question, how long, God, is this going to take? What's the drive for that question? Is it coming from a place of fear, control, anxiety, or from a place of faith, openness, and surrender? Let's be real before God and one another this morning. Solomon, he had a plan. He had a timeline for the way that things were going to work. I mean, he served in his position for probably over 40 years, and he got to accomplish a lot, build the temple, do all kinds of things, right? But then at one point, things did not go according to Solomon's plan, according to Solomon's timing. And he he learned a lot in his life. In his life, again, the Bible doesn't try to cover this up. He tried to make a lot of things happen. He tried to force a bunch of things to happen. If he got tired of one person, he just replaced them with someone else. And as an old man, he's reflecting on how much time he wasted trying to just manipulate outcomes, 
trying to force people to do things His way, trying to force God to do things His way. And as an old man, he's writing this book because he's come to realize a simple and profound truth from God above. And it's this. There is a time for everything. And it's not our timing, it's God's timing. When he was younger, when Solomon was younger, he wanted things on demand, right? And he had the power to do that. But toward the end of his life, he realizes, no, these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 are the truth about, the, about time. There's a time and a season for everything, and it's not our timing, it's God's timing. So maybe in this time of waiting, you may be thinking to yourself, or you, again, you're reflecting on what kind of attitude you have before God, or maybe you're asking yourself, and I don't know if shame or guilt perhaps has been holding you back from it, or pride, and maybe you're asking yourself the question, when is the right time to reach out to God? During my waiting. And friends, brothers, sisters, I want you to hear this loud and clear. The time is now. Now is the time. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. Not when you feel like you have everything balanced, right? And I've done tons of pastoral care, and I've done a lot of self-talk, and I've had to talk myself out of bad situations too. And a lot of times there's this popular phrase, right? No, not right now until I have balance in my life. But here's the truth. Balance is overrated. Balance in this life is probably not real, to be honest. This life, as Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3 talks about, is a life of seasons. We're always in a season. And in a season, what do we have to make? Choices and priorities. We make choices and priorities in all kinds of seasons that we're in. You know, it's like uh, even learning from the law of the farm, our ag uh, neighbors here that so graciously provide this food for us. They know that they're always in a season. They can't decide when harvest comes. They can't decide when they're going to do that or this or just when things are balanced, then they're going to work on it. No, we have people within our community like th that, that do that kind of work. And in this life, we're always in a season. So really what we have is an option to make priorities and choices and wise choices. And I love how one, one person that I admire a lot, he was this German uh, pastor and theologian, <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he really said this, and I thought it was very profound, and he was a person that had ex experienced extreme challenges and persecution in his life. If, if we had time, I'd go more into it, but he once said this. He said, really, in this life, what you can do, again, surrender to Christ, but do your best, and then throw yourself at the mercy of God. <laughs> Do your best and throw yourself at the mercy of God. He will work with that. That's enough for Jesus. He's not looking for you to have this perfect balance in your life. You're never going to have it. You're always going to be in a season. And in those seasons, there's choices to be made and priorities. <laughs> he doesn't look for perfection from me or you. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. He will perfect you. So do your best and throw yourself at the mercy of God. He loves you. It's not a condition for him. Draw near to him. Don't just wait until things get back to normal for you. Don't just wait until things are stabilized for you to draw near to God. But now is the time to reach out, to draw near to him, to grow closer to him, to trust God, to entrust your life, to entrust your time, to entrust your circumstances over to God. Now is the time. 
Now's the time that you can glorify God. You can glorify God in your waiting. You can glorify God in your suffering. You can glorify God in your non-ideal circumstances. He's there with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. If you hear anything from this message, I want you to hear this. Time belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you or me. We exist in time. Yet it's funny, right? What, what's, what are the phrases we use in American English? I don't have time. Yeah, none of us do. <laughs> it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. That would be very similar to, and there's this writer, uh, C.S. Lewis, who talks about that. The way humans interact with time is, is so funny because it would be a lot like, um, the, because the truth is none of us own time. We all exist in time, just like we exist in creation, just as we exist in the earth, in the universe. So it would be similar like any of us trying to say, oh, I don't have earth, or I don't have universe, I don't have stars. Of course, it's not yours. <laughs> it was never meant to be yours. You live within that creation, and time is a creation from God. It belongs to God, and we exist in it. We're not in control of time, but we are stewards of time. In the same way God has asked you, he created you in his image, and God stewards all of creation. He's asked you to steward of your money, of your home, of your family, of your resources. He is asking you to reflect him by stewarding your time. Steward your time for God's glory. As a gospel-centered community here at Imago, we give generously of our tithes and offerings of our money, and we're also generous with our time because it's the same lesson with money and the same lesson with time. It all belongs to God. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's His. We get to steward it and glorify Him through all of it. I'll never forget the words of, of a dear friend and a mentor that I had back in my 20s. And I've shared this story with some of you before, but I keep coming back to it because it really just kind of stopped me on my tracks and forever changed my attitude when it comes to time. And um, this friend and mentor, brilliant, brilliant person, her name is... Uh, Dr. Lara Buchak. She's done all kinds of things. I, I studied philosophy in my undergrad, so she's a professor in philosophy. She's now at Princeton University, one of the top in, in the country, and she's done a lot of work in something called game theory. If you're ever interested, go ahead and, and check that out, and Lara Buchak has written a lot on that. But on top of just being a brilliant person, a brilliant author, professor, speaker, She's also a committed church member and a committed Christ follower. She's a committed wife and a committed mother. She's way busier than I will ever probably be in my life. And this is not at all any kind of this or that or comparison. It's really just sharing her story and her words in that. But I remember years and years ago, I was trying to get some kind of extension on an assignment. And I was extremely stressed. I was overwhelmed. And um, I, I went to uh, Lara Buchek, to Dr. Buchek, who was teaching me a class at this time. And I shared with her just how stressed I was and how overwhelmed I was in my life. And uh, here's the truth, and I've shared this with some people in their 20s. I was in my 20s back then. I was single. I had no children. The truth is I had no idea what I was talking about. I had time. I just acted like I didn't. <laughs> you know? And that was probably the most flexible time I ever had in my life back then. But anyway, I was talking to uh, Dr. Buchak, to Lara Buchak here, and I was trying to get her sympathies. And I was trying to get her to give me a little bit more time. And I told her, Dr. Buchak, the truth is this, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I don't have time. 
I don't even, and then I was even trying to, you know, get a tearjerker in there with her and saying things like, I don't even have time to go to church right now. I don't even have time to read the Bible right now. And as I'm saying that, Dr. Buchek just stops me. And she says, okay, okay, Carlos, enough of the dramatic speech. You know, and I, I, was, I was bringing drama that day. I mean, Oscar-worthy drama. And she didn't sell to say those exact words. She's much nicer. But she stopped me. Enough of the dramatic speech. Here's the bottom line truth when it comes to time. And this is coming from a renowned author, speaker, professor, committed church member, wife, mother, all of that. But she said this, here's the truth. Give God the time and God will give you the time. Give God the time and God will give you the time that you need. If you do not give God the time, you will never have time because it doesn't belong to you. Give God the time and he will give you the time that you need because time belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It's his and the Lord gives and he takes away. He gives time graciously, but it all belongs to him. He will be glorified through any time, through any circumstance, through any season that you're in right now. If you're in a season of waiting, he will be glorified. He's building up your character. He's building you up to reflect him more. He's teaching you to persevere. He's teaching you to hold on to him, especially in times of waiting and of desperation. So where are you in this passage? In this passage that reminds us that there's a time and a season for everything. How's your waiting going? Are you waiting from a place of fear? From a place of faith? Or is it sometimes this strange tightrope, this weird mix of both fear and faith? I've been there. Most of us have been there too. However it is we find ourselves, now is the time. Now is the time to reach out and to touch Jesus, to reach out to God. He is here. He is willing to love you, to forgive you, to restore you. He is the great healer. He is the great defender. So today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, not when things are balanced and perfect, but today, now, in this season, reach out to God. Reach out to Christ. He will reach back to you. We can encounter him here and now. Time belongs to God. You belong to God. And when we give God the time, He gives us the time that we need. There's a time and a season for everything under the sun. But I do want us, before we pray, to go back to that verse in 11. As it says, we've gone through everything. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and then we'll read the end there in verse 11. There is a time and a season for everything under the sun. But then I want you to see this in verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set an eternity in the hearts of, 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 of men and women. He has set an eternity in our hearts, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Fathom just means understand. They cannot understand what God has done from beginning to end. So in the season of waiting, in the season of wanting, in the season of crying out for the Lord, remember there is a time and a place for everything 
and that he has made everything beautiful in its time. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that only you can do this. Only you can see the mess that is our life sometimes, walking on this tightrope of fear and faith. And you can still see that, and you are not intimidated, and you don't run away. You don't give up on us, Lord. Instead, you say, I'll work with that, and I will make everything beautiful in its time. I will make that family challenge beautiful in its time. I will make that desperation and depression and anxiety beautiful in its time. I will make that longing, Lord, in moments when we feel worthless, when we feel unworthy, Lord, you say, I see that. I will make it beautiful in its time. Thank you, Lord, for your timing. It's not ours, but it all belongs to you. Help us, Lord, today to be able to just live in that peace, in that security, and in that comfort. That time belongs to you, and we belong to you, Jesus. Meet us in this place, here and now. Take us where we need to be. Show us your way, O oh God. Show us your wisdom. Show us your light. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.